The Taku River Tlingit have been hunting in this area forever. This is our traditional territory. This is where we hunted. And uh, my dad taught me to shoot at, at a very young age and how to hunt. It's very important. Keeping things renewable, not taking too much in a certain area. You take what you need and you leave the rest to grow. It's going to be there next year and, and down the road. That's the way we've always been and, and the way we are today. We would want to leave that for seven generations and seven generations beyond that. Dude, there's so many caribou. Look at the tops on that one. That bull's, bull's weak, young. That's a cow. That's a small bull. Hunters were the original conservationists, and there's a reason for that. When we talk about concepts like stewardship and hunters being the original stewards of the land, when you're out there and you're the eyes and the ears on the land, and you develop that passion and that, that deep connection with the land and the animals that travel the land, I think it changes you as a person. Hunting connects you to the land and it creates within you a connection that is unique. It's not just making use of the animal, consuming all the meat, using the hide, sharing the meat with friends, family, and neighbors. It's about that animal being out there living that life, that pure life, and the karma of that animal being there when I go to harvest that animal, and in a sense giving it itself to me. Those three rams again, they're up in that bowl. Our moose numbers are okay. Our caribou numbers are increasing a little bit. And there's hope that, that those numbers will continue to grow. The only species of concern right now would be sheep. Their numbers are declining somewhat. Near as we can tell, that's climate change. And that is uh, over the last couple of winters, there's been an increase in the snowfall which makes the food difficult for them to get at. And we suspect that uh, the mortality rate is because they can't get enough food over the winter. Really tend to start walking down there and trying to glass back into there where there's sun. I just wouldn't mind seeing a caribou before we go to bed. All right, well, let's start packing up then. Unless we see caribou start coming out of these drainages in the next five minutes while we're packing. I'll make a bet that we don't. <laughs> I'm not going to take you up on that one. Odds are very heavily in my favor. Yeah. <clears throat>
Let's go find a good one, eh? Uh, solid 260. <laughs> 360, okay? Let's be fair. Pretty new. It's not steaming. One of them vegan ones oh. from downtown. Yeah? He's eating grass. He's gonna be mighty upset that we're disrupting all this bush to eat then. I know, man. a huge bear there. Like Jeff, that thing's a stomper, man. Buddy, that looks like a Kodiak brown bear. <laughs> like this might be so wrong of me to say right now, but the fact that in under 48 hours, we've seen seven grizzly bears, four cubs, and in BC, five years ago, they made the decision based on a motion to shut down grizzly bear hunting. Kind of speaks to a lot of different things going on around wildlife. Yeah. It's it's not what's right for them. I mean, there shouldn't be this many grizzly bears sitting in one basin. What does that mean for the ungulate population in here? At the end of the day, like all this shit needs to be done by science. Like all the, the management that we do needs to continue to be done by science or needs to start being done by science because it seems like we've drifted away from that. And whether it's mass moose closures across the province, closing grizzly bears because the public doesn't think it looks nice, or the caribou populations are coming back up and now they're closing more caribou hunting. And it's just like, you can only watch it happen so much before you're just like, well, that is the standard and that is the playbook that continues to get played. If there is a problem with ungulates or any wildlife population, we need to look at everything. You can't just blanket close hunting as the solution for it. And I'm not saying like hunting sucks to close for myself. Like I'm, I'm saying it's, I'd be the first one to say I'll, I'll never hunt again to make sure that there's wildlife on the landscape and my kids get to hunt. But to just have no blanket plan or evidence or anything, it's hard for, you know, it's, it's hard to see because it feels like, it feels like more of an attack on hunting than it does even on anything else. Like it's, it's not, it, it really, it doesn't seem like it is about the wildlife or it is about so much, it's just that idea of hunting and the action of hunting feels like that's being attacked constantly. Oh, 100%. Oh my God, look at the tops on this bull tanner. I can see from here, man. Dude, he's so wide. That thing's ginormous. Okay, so I'm gonna just drop down to the creek, run that creek straight up to that gravel bar. Cause okay. what do you think that gravel bar is to him? 300. That distance, 300. But then <laughs> so, as you get to the gravel bar, check your wind. Cause the wind's blowing all up right now. Mm -hmm. So I'd actually go up over the gravel bar cause you're gonna be a little bit higher than him. And then I think there's gonna be a little bit of like a drop in the ground there. Mm -hmm. As soon as you clear that gravel bar, you're gonna be at the same elevation as him. Okay. And then you're gonna drop in and then come up and you should be within 150 of him there. And if he changes his position, I'll tell you, but he's just sitting there feeding right now. Okay, we're gonna groove then. We got going up like an hour of daylight, so. Okay, buddy. Okay.
be right here. We're all gone. Let's see. Anybody need to go back in here? One? Yeah, that's that ball. He's right on the top. Yeah, I got him. Two big ones in there now. But the one at the back, I think, is still that big, big one. Okay, they're going fast, man. Let's go. There's still 500. Yeah, let's get closer. Okay. Here, cut straight hard up this depression and bounce right up right there. Okay, let's boogie right. Good shot, Dad. 
Aubrey's gonna go find that bush. There's an Aubrey here to the left of that bush. Oh my god, he's right there. I got no shot, Jeff. Give me, give me your rifle. This is literally everything, an old bull. There's how many other bulls in this herd to keep mating. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's everything. It's everything, man. This is like, you know, you look at certain animals and you just take character over score sometimes because... Well, it doesn't, I mean, score doesn't matter, right? No. Like, I mean, it's... You and look, age, like how about age? age. Like, like, look at that, look at the... And, and like I totally get like the whole scoring process is to determine age and you know maturity and stuff. Genetics. And there is a point though where a person, like you sit there and you look at an animal, especially out here, and you, you see, we've seen so many and you're like, oh, what's that? And you're like trying to count tines or like look at it. And when you just see a bull like this and you're like, that is an old mature bull. Thanks buddy. It's uh, pretty amazing to know where your meat comes from and uh, you know the fact that the meat that's going to sustain us and our immediate family and our friends as well is uh, it's amazing you know it's it's why we do this it's it's why being connected as a hunter on your landscape is so important if more people understood where their meat came from understood what it means to take an animal's life, what it means to hunt and harvest, whether you're harvesting crops or hunting animals or fishing on this land. If more people did it, there'd be a, I think there'd be a lot less waste in this world, a lot less neediness, and uh, more people would have better connection to the nature that they live in. And we're lucky as hunters that we get to do this. And it's, I think it's so important that, you know, we, we talked a lot about, or I talk a lot about, and so many people do about old age class animals, which some people see as trophies, but you're doing that because it's what's best for the herd and what's best for those animals. And as you can see, we're taking every ounce of meat that we're going to. And as amazing as the rack is or the trophy, um, Everything right here is big of a trophy and this backstrap right here that's gonna it's gonna feed feed a lot of people and feed ourselves. That's that's a trophy. It's gonna feed us tonight, that's for sure. That it is. Certain components of society are advocating that hunting is no longer relevant in the wildlife management system today. I would argue that there isn't a better time for hunting to be relevant. The conservation model of wildlife in today's society is more than ever tied to a value chain of relevance. Wildlife must have a purpose, going beyond a mere existence to a value add for people. You're a real one, Jeff. I appreciate you. If I've never told you that. Yeah. 
Yep. Good. Yep. Good. Hunting and harvesting is a connection to the land. And for me, that reverence for that animal and that meat, the hide and the organs and all the parts of that meat, how we share it amongst our friends and our family is critically important, I think, to the world, to the ecosystem, to the way we view conservation and to this broader idea of how human beings are gonna survive on this planet. Holy, that was a, that was a heavy one. We live in a day and age where we don't need to hunt. We can live a whole lifetime without killing an animal, without catching a fish, killing it, and cleaning it and eating it. We can live a lifetime without getting any blood on our hands. But my question is, just because we can live that way, does that mean we should live that way?